We are excited today to have a special guest. Uh, his name is known to a lot of people uh, in the US and MENA region, Dr. James Zuhbi. As a prominent uh, advocate for Arab American issues and well-known voice in the US politics, Dr. James Zuhbi brings invaluable insights on the challenges and opportunities facing the Arab American community. His work, especially through the Arab American Institute and uh, Zuhbi Research Services has shaped discussion on policy, civil rights, and the role of Arab Americans in the broader political landscape. We are looking forward, and I'm looking forward uh, to hear his perspective on uh, key issues and, and, uh, and the issues relating to uh, the presidential elections in this cycle. Uh, Dr. Zubi, welcome uh, to uh, this uh, podcast, and I'm really honored uh, to have you with us. I used to uh, watch you in, in the Middle East through Abu Dhabi TV, uh, as I remember, when I was kind of kind of politically developing, uh, hearing your insights and how Arab Americans are approaching uh, different issues uh, in the U.S. Welcome to this podcast. Thank you, Zaid. I think I have, uh, I, I, what I want to say right now is that I think I should shut up and not say anything after that introduction. Um, I uh, I don't want to let anybody down by uh, by not living up to the introduction. Thank you so much for those words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Let me start with a personal note. Uh, yesterday I was reading in the New York Times that people are kind of torn. They don't know if they want to vote and uh, uh, if they vote, to whom they will cast their vote. So personally, would you vote in this election or did you vote in this election, Dr. Zubi? I already voted. Yes, I did. That's good. But I understand, <laughs> I understand from, from the polling we've done and from conversations I've had with people that uh, this, uh, there, there are a lot of people who are very torn. Uh, torn because they don't feel they have a choice, um, and especially those for whom uh, what is happening in the Middle East is so devastating. Uh, they want something that will promise change, and they don't feel change. Uh, even those who've drifted over to the Trump camp um, are more often than not punishing Democrats than uh, than enthusiastic about the promise that Donald Trump brings. Um, and we're finding in the polling that when we ask how enthusiastic are you about this election, the level of enthusiasm is down. Uh, so I think people feel conflicted. But would you advise them to vote or not? Oh, of course, I, I, I always advise to vote. And look, you know, I, I do believe there's a fundamental difference between the campaigns. Uh, I do. And, um, and while, uh, you know, I certainly want more um, and dramatic change uh, with regard to how U.S. deals with Palestinians uh, in particular, but also with the enabling of Israel's aggression um, everywhere. I mean, they're bombing with impunity um, countries all over the region <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and the administration's let them get away with it. And that's mm -hmm. worrisome, very worrisome. Uh, and while that that's an issue, I, 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 number one, I think that Kamala Harris is 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 different than Joe Biden. Um, she is of a different generation. Uh, she is not part of that Cold War mindset um, that uh, that 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 shaped this administration. Um, uh, she's also a woman of color, and that makes a difference. Uh, I don't think we're seeing it in the campaign uh, because I think she's. Um, being overly cautious about things she says and does, that worries me. Um, it worries me because uh, if she doesn't break free, uh, it's hard once you're elected to break free. Uh, you govern as you run, and I, I think that there are some worrisome signs there. But at the same time, when people tell me there's no different be difference between the candidates, I say, go to Springfield, Ohio, and talk to a Haitian father who's afraid to send his kids to school. Mm -hmm. um, Remember, just remember the four years under Donald Trump and what it was like um, in in for not just for Muslims, but, you know, but for many commun immigrant communities, um, Arabs in particular, but Mexicans uh, and others from uh, Central and, and South America. Uh, and I don't want to relive that again. I just don't. Uh, so uh, there is a difference. 
maybe more in terms of domestic policy than foreign policy, but I do think that there'll be a difference in foreign policy as well. This will not be the kind of uh, Reagan-esque Cold War mindset that Joe Biden has brought to the mm -hmm. White House. I think people don't remember, because I do, because I'm old, that Joe Biden actually was mentored by Scoop Jackson, uh, a Democrat, in whose office incubated the neoconservative movement that drifted over to the Reagan White House. Um, and uh, that he, he's never changed his views since then. And so I, I never had any expectation that Joe Biden would be different than he is. Uh, but I do believe that Kamala Harris will be different than Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. uh, the president, do you know, do you think that the Arab community know who is uh, Kamala Harris? I mean, we know who is uh, Donald Trump. Uh, I, I think that they're still being acquainted with her. Uh, and um, I, I put the fault on the two things. One is the short span of the campaign. Um, she didn't get into it. Joe Biden didn't step out until really late in the game. Um, and um, and I, I think that the Biden White House uh, failed in terms of outreach. Um, my first big encounter in Washington with the White House, I started with Carter and then went through Reagan and Bush, but the, the most serious outreach was made by the Clinton administration. And I got spoiled. Uh, we were meeting with the president um, every few months. We were meeting with the vice president uh, very often. Uh, he'd call directly and say, this happened, I want to get together with Lebanese, or this happened, I want to get together with Palestinians, or I want to meet with Arab American leaders. And, um, and that followed through with the whole rest of his administration. The, it came from the top down that we were going to engage with people. Um, that has not happened in the Biden White House. I don't know why, uh, but frankly, you know, we spent the first three and a half years without a single meeting with the president. And when they met with anybody lower down, um, it was a Muslim meeting. And I'd go to these meetings um, and there'd be 12 people in the room, Pakistani, South Asian of different sorts and, uh, and African-American and, uh, you know, and maybe three Arabs. Um, and none of the Arab American organizations other than mine would be actually represented. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so there was a lack of feeling that they even wanted to include us. Uh, that they even respected who we were. Um, and when she, and that would, followed through, and the vice president doesn't make her own schedule. She doesn't, uh, you know, she, all this comes through the, the president's side. So she didn't have any meetings with Arab Americans. Um, she called, we would talk, but, um, but, but in, in terms of being able to expose her to the broader community, that never happened. And so she's getting into the game quite late. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, Watching presidential campaigns as I have now since I served as an official in the Jackson campaigns in the 80s, I know what advisors do to candidates, how they don't say this and please say that and don't do this and don't do that. And it ties you up in knots. And I can hear her when she's speaking uh, and answering a tough question. I can hear her thinking <laughs> in her head about don't say this. Please say that. Do it this way. Do it that way. More uh, scripted I, uh, meetings. Huh? They are scripted meetings. I mean. Yeah. And, and, um, and I think that's because she's new to the game um, and she's uh, under a lot of pressure. But at some point she needs to break three and break, break free. And as they used to say about Reagan, let Reagan be Reagan. I'd say let Kamala be Kamala. Um, co conversations you have with her on the phone are one thing. Watching her do these public things is something else. She has very good ideas. She has to be free enough and confident enough to express them in public. And frankly, from the polling I've seen, if she were to take some dramatic steps on issues uh, like the Middle East, she wouldn't lose votes. She'd pick up votes. Mm -hmm. People want to see leadership. They don't want to see scripts. Um, there is this issue, uh, Dr. Zogby, maybe from the 30s, I mean, the Arab community is accused of being so much related to the Palestinian issue more than any other domestic issue. So maybe from that angle, 
they are kind of trying to avoid maybe um, uh, this conversation with the Arab community. Well, that's like I said, that's not how either the the Clinton administration dealt with us, nor was it how the Obama administration dealt with us. Um, and and I, I would say to some extent, um, we've done a little better with some other agencies. So for example, we've done better with the Justice Department in the last couple of years. We've done better with Homeland Security and Department of Education. But that's because we fought and pushed real hard. But in terms of the White House and the Vice President's Office, uh, the outreach has been minimal, um, if at all. And um, and when you're running for office, people don't say, oh, you met with the Secretary of Education. They want to know, did you meet with the candidate? And and so far, there's been no meetings with the candidate um, that have involved the leadership of the community. And that makes a, that makes a difference. Um, uh, and on the other hand, you've got Donald Trump, who basically doesn't give a damn. Uh, will say whatever he wants to say, doesn't mean it, just... I'm going to bring peace. You trust me. I'll bring peace, and and I want the Arab community, and I'm 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 here. And he'll go and promise them anything, and as he does with every other constituency, um, and people longing for attention will go and say, "Oh, Donald Trump wants us." Um, and uh, on the other hand, you have caution versus, an, uh, you know, recklessness, and uh, recklessness seems attractive. <clears throat> and unfortunately, he's he's a- actually picking up some support. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Zubi, do you think that the Arabs in the region has uh, or have more support to Trump uh, or Harris uh, in comparison to the Arab Americans from your? Uh, uh, I dare say that in the region, there is a growing sense that it doesn't matter. Um, they've they've been to hell and back. Uh, this started, I think, with Bush in 2003 with the Iraq War, and they have. And Obama then made all promises and didn't deliver, uh, and then Trump tore everything down, and Biden has done nothing to rebuild uh, in a, in a serious way. And I think that, that it's almost a healthy thing in the region that people have decided if there's going to be stability, we're going to create it on our own. We have to build new relationships on our own, um, and and so GCC meeting with Iran, uh, for example, um, um, is an uh, the BRICS expansion of BRICS, uh, and to some extent the Abraham Accord. I mean, it's like there's all these new relationships being built to create a new architecture. It needs to all come together. There needs to be something like an OSCE that stabilized Europe for decades until the fall of the, the Iron Curtain. Um, there needs to be something like that in the Middle East um, so that the, the countries of the region, all of them, uh, are sitting together and working through problems and stabilizing the situation. But the prerequisite to that happening has to be a Palestinian state has to be formed. And I, and I do think that you, you hinted at this before. I call Palestine the wound in the Arab heart that never healed. It it's uh, um, people say, why? Why is this so important? And um, uh, why does it mean so much to Arabs? And um, and, th- and then accuse us of anti-Semitism because <laughs> because we focus on it. And th- the reality is that it it is like wounded knee that uh, was to Native Americans, or like the Holocaust is to Jews. It's it's a tragedy. Nakba was a tragedy that happened to people very much like us. Uh, Wherever you are in the Arab region, it was somebody like us. It was a wound in the heart. um, And it just keeps coming back and reminding us. And if anybody forgot that wound, what's happened in the last year has reminded everyone of it. And and so people who uh, in the region ideologically will hate Hamas will find themselves gripped in pain by what is happening to people in Gaza. Um, and, uh, and that's true here as well. Um, you know, third generation uh, Lebanese Maronites um, losing sleep over, uh, you know, the, the genocide. Um, it, it is, it's a gripping issue. And the evidence of how gripping it is, is that people for whom this issue never even existed, um, young people, black voters, Latino, Asian voters, uh, they 
they care about it in a way that, frankly, um, is is quite startling uh, how much they care. Young progressive Jews um, are going out and doing things that we never even dreamt or, or had the courage to do, shutting down Congress, shutting down Union Station, shutting down Penn Station in New York or Grand Central. Uh, these are courageous kids uh, motivated by the pain that they're seeing play out in real time. And, uh, and so this issue has become gripping uh, of, of an entire generation of people. Can we say that uh, one of the steps in the development of the Arab American community uh, participation in the American politics is that what we are witnessing, the protest movement and uh, this kind of activism that it's new to uh, everybody. Um, uh, do you see any impact from that on the Arab community vote uh, now and in the future? Yeah, I think it's not going to go away um, at all. I, I look, I worry that people are, 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 are going to make the wrong choice in November. Uh, to abstain, not vote. We fought too hard to to guarantee our right uh, to be included. I don't want to see us marginalize ourselves. Look, when I started in this um, back in the in the in the seventies and early eighties during the civil war in Lebanon, um, and then when we first got organized, what we were finding was uh, campaigns giving back money uh, because they were challenged. Why are you taking money from the Arabs? Uh, campaigns rejecting our endorsement. Um, we were excluded and marginalized. Uh, we tried to we get into a coalition and uh, we won the vote uh, to be admitted in the Coalition on New Foreign Policy. Um, and three Jewish groups objected that we were there and said, if you let them in, uh, we'll withdraw and we were asked to leave. Uh, in 1983, the 20th anniversary of the March on Martin Luther King's March on Washington, we were invited to serve on the National Steering Committee. Same thing. Group said, if you let the Arabs in, we're out. And they asked us to withdraw. But thank God we had Jesse Jackson fighting for us. And ultimately, the decision was made to keep us no matter what the other group said. Um, but that's always been a problem. <clears throat> and then we got included and we became part of the Democratic and Republican Party and seeing uh, people today either encouraging people not to vote or to vote for some fly-by-night third-party candidate that's going to get a percent of the vote is a kind of self-marginalization. And frankly, I fought and my generation fought too hard to have us included in the mainstream, to have us see people decide to pull us out of the mainstream and, and, and basically marginalize ourselves. I, I just don't see it as making sense. So I, I worry about that. Um, I think we have leverage. I think we have to use the leverage. I think what they did with uncommitted was brilliant. It showed leverage. But to go from uncommitted to, you know, voting for a third party candidate who will never be seen again, to me, makes no sense, um, especially when there are so many other issues that matter. And when we have allies who count on us, we count on people supporting us, uh, we have to support them too. <laughs> if we're going to ask uh, Black and Latino and Asian and other you know, minority communities to support us, and they do support us on Palestine, then we have to support them on civil rights, on, on immigrant rights, on um, civil liberties. Uh, and we can't say what well, it's all for us and us for us. It's got to be all for us and us for all. Um, and I, I, that's why I, I think, you know, I question the wisdom of either abstaining or of voting for irrelevant candidates. They, mm -hmm. they say, well, we're voting our conscience. Um, I'm voting my conscience, too. <laughs> but my conscience says I have a responsibility to everybody. I have a responsibility to women's rights. I have a responsibility to the environment. I have a responsibility to my kids and my grandkids in the future that they'll be growing up in. I have a responsibility to immigrants coming to this country. Uh, I have a responsibility on all those levels, and I'm voting my conscience. Even if it doesn't agree with you, I'm not going to you know, say you're not voting your conscience. I think it's wrong. You can say I'm wrong, but don't say I'm not voting my conscience. That's, 
that's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. uh, this is leading me to this question. Who are our allies in this vote, uh, Dr. Zorbi? Well, look, I mean, you can see from just the polling that um, today on the Democratic side, for the first time in polling nationally, um, Palestinians are viewed more favorably than Israelis. And when you ask the question uh, about military assistance to Israel, a majority of Democrats say it should be suspended. And if you look what's behind that majority, it's young people, two to one say suspend it. Black voters, Asian voters, two to one say suspend it. So those who are allies, and in the, in, in, we have allies in the women's movement. We have allies in the, in the, the, the LGBTQ community who have been very pro-Palestinian because they know what it means to be discriminated against and they don't want to see it happening to Palestinians too. Um, uh, we have allies in the environmental community. We, you know, the, the, in the, the realm of groups in the, the progressive political sphere, <clears throat> we have allies all over the place. Look at the Bernie Sanders campaign and the people that came together around that. We have allies in the Jewish community, especially among young Jews and groups like um, If Not Now and uh, Rabbis for, for uh, Ceasefire. There's a lot of groups out there who are doing incre incredible work with us. Um, we got 340 cities to pass ceasefire resolutions uh, during the, the first six months of this. Now, we didn't change policy, but we did change people's minds. And we did impact uh, on the local level choices that people were making. Uh, there was uh, this article in Forward, uh, Dr. Zogby, um, they were saying that uh, Harris didn't give any spot to a Palestinian or any Arab in, during the DNC. This is an indication that our lobby and our effort is more important to the Democrats than the Arab community uh, efforts in, in this regard. To what degree you, you, you agree with this uh, approach? I think it was a fatal error on her part. Uh, and I'm not even sure it was her part. I'm not sure that she actually made the decision. I just don't, I just don't see it. I've worked on presidential campaigns and um, most of the decisions like that get made by what uh, Jesse Jackson used to call the smart ass white boys, except today they're not all white and they're not all boys. They're the, the political consultants who, uh, whose sense of the electorate of the voting population is as out of touch as the their counterparts in the foreign policy world are simply unaware of the changes that are taking place in the world community. Um, she would not have lost five votes if she'd had a Palestinian who lost family in Gaza speak. She would have picked up votes. Um, the forward, <laughs> had an editorial saying they should have let a Palestinian speak. Haaretz had an editorial, they should have let a Palestinian speak. The Israeli-American family that spoke said they should have had a Palestinian-American family speak. It was a no-brainer. And the, the woman that was being proposed was somebody who, from San Francisco, who uh, Kamala Harris has known for 27 years, who supported her campaigns, who had, is from Gaza, had family in Gaza that lost their lives, it would have been so easy for her to do this, um, for the campaign to do it. They made a bad choice, really bad choice. I don't think, I don't like I said, I don't think it was the candidate who made the choice, but I also think that it was an indication of bad judgment on the part of the, the team advising the campaign. So it, it was not calculated? Uh, no, I, you know, except that the extent to which the 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 smart ass white boys think that they know everything, um, and the same kind of ridiculous judgment that leads them to advise her to take Liz Cheney uh, on a tour with her in Pennsylvania to drum up the votes uh, and to win over moderate Republicans. On what planet does anybody see Liz Cheney as a moderate Republican? Um, she's one of the most hardline conservatives in the business. And she's not loved by moderate Republicans. And she's also not loved by the Trump people. Where are the votes? 
in 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 recruiting Liz Cheney, she may lose some votes uh, instead of gaining some votes. I, the judgment call here is a bad one. Um, and again, it's because the political consultants, do you remember Ben Rhodes in the Obama administration talked about the blob, the foreign policy blob? These are the guys you see on television all the time. They served in past administrations and failed, but then they get jobs in think tanks and continue to fail. And they bring their failed wisdom, quote unquote, into the marketplace and they sell it as uh, as good ideas. And, and they have no sense of where the world is how the world has changed. America is no longer the shiny. We're no longer what Madeleine Albright said, the indispensable nation. We, 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 we're now looked at as a country that has violated international law ourselves, um, has changed the world for the worst, um, and is not respected in public opinion. And even Arab leaders who respect the US, respect the US only because they think that they have to do it um, for their own interests, but they're doing it against their own, you know, they, they don't feel comfortable, which is why they also keep China in their back pocket or keep re relations with Russia open and are now beginning to engage with Iran in a serious way because they know that America can't lead any. Well, the foreign policy establishment is out of touch, but the political consultancy class is also out of touch. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that Liz Cheney may pick up five votes, may, maybe, maybe, but the risk of losing black voters or losing um, Arab voters or losing progressive uh, voters from the white community uh, is, is a risk. I mean, seeing your candidate with Liz Cheney, who endorsed torture, who endorsed the failed Iraq war, who condemned Obama, because I know because I debated her on CNN when Obama gave his Cairo speech, <laughs> She said she accused Obama of betraying America. Um, I mean, is that the person you're going to go to to get votes? I don't get it. Who thought that idea was a good one? Um, the same people who thought not having a Palestinian on stage was a good one. Dumb. Uh, <laughs> Let me ask you about the teams around the two the two candidates. How how do you see? the pool of people that Harris will select for foreign policy, for national security, and Trump's people? Well, the people who are in the White House now working for, for, for Kamala uh, are good people who have some, I mean, Phil Gordon is a very creative thinker and has represents new thought. I do think so. The Trump people worry me. <laughs> um, look, we've already seen this cast of characters before. Um, and uh, I don't want Steve Miller back. Um, I don't want uh, any of these guys back. And yet that's, a, I'm pretty sure what we're going to get. Where do you see the Arab votes 10 years from now, Victor Zoe? It's going to depend on candidates. Um, it will. Uh, I think we were voting two to one Democrat for about maybe 15 years. Um, it's now collapsed and they're back to even. Uh, in the last poll we did of Arab Americans, it was 42 Trump, 41 Harris. Uh, but I, I dare say if there is a candidate um, who inspires uh, the community, uh, it, that'll, it'll, it'll, it'll change. I consider myself a Democrat because I grew up in that world. Um, older people born here have that sense of identification with a party. Um, younger people and immigrants don't have that sense of loyalty to a party because they didn't grow up in that world. They didn't grow up with an attachment to it. Um, and so that's what we find, for example, in a state like Michigan with Arab Americans is that they, the population skews younger and skews more immigrant. And so they'll go from Democrat, to, they'll vote from Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump because they have no sense of, of groundedness in a party idea. You know, that's why there's such fluctuation um, with the Arab. Now, if you go to Pennsylvania, where the Arab community is older and more settled there, uh, they will stay in the party. They'll vote consistently, either Democrat or Republican, based on their ideology that they've had for, for decades and in some cases, generations. Among that generation of 
born here uh, Americans, uh, political party is like religion. It's like, you know, I'm a Catholic or I'm a Protestant or I'm a Muslim or I'm a Jew and I don't change, right? And that's what I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. But younger people don't feel that. They don't feel that sense of attachment. Neither do recent immigrants. I'm seeing Trump pick up support in the Yemeni community because they they are not thinking about all the other issues. They're thinking about the fact that he came to them, uh, that he talked about them, that he went to their uh, their 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 rally and shook their hands. That's all they want. And uh, the question is, can we uh, bring? Can can Harris bring those people back? Can the Democrats bring those people back? A candidate who made a difference, who did that uh, outreach uh, and paid attention to the community, could do it. But it remains to be seen if it will be done. It's less ideology and it's more excitement and and um, and inclusion and making people feel welcome. Mm -hmm. Dr. let me close with this. I mean, Arab Americans started to be kind of Republicans when they started their activism, their their uh, work in the inside the American politics. The war of 1990, the war of 2003 alienated them towards the Democrats. And now we see this this war uh, in the Middle East. Do you think that it's pushing the, demo, the, the Arab Americans towards kind of the third, the third party, Jill, Jill Stein and, and, and others? No, uh, I've seen some things that call themselves polls that aren't really polls at all. Um, they were an email to the, mem the members of the organization or <laughs> they were SMS. Um, that's not a poll. Um, I don't think that Arab Americans are drifting toward the third party. Uh, there'll be some who will. But it's not going to be as large as it was with Ralph Nader in 2000. Um, he was Arab American, and that made a difference. Um, I think it'll be a, a few percentage points. That's it. Um, but let me also correct you that Arab Americans never were heavily Republican. Um, back when we first started polling in the in the early 90s, um, they leaned Democrat, like every other ethnic group like the Italian, like the Irish, like the Polish, because we polled all those groups too, they would be 36% Democrat, 32% Republican, 38% Democrat, 35% Republican. They leaned Democrat. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until uh, the second Bush, Bush term that the numbers opened up and became two to one uh, Democrat. It had a lot to do with the Iraq war and a lot to do with the the, the policies pursued by the Bush administration that uh, so discriminated against uh, people here, Arabs and, and Muslims. Um, and it stayed that way, like I said, till 2020. Um, and right now it's collapsed and it's collapsed because of Gaza uh, and because of the policies of, of Joe Biden and the, the way that Biden ignored Arab, Arab voters. And so could that change again? Yeah. If, if somebody like a Bernie Sanders ran, uh, or if somebody like a Jesse Jackson ran uh, and did outreach to the community, it would create a, a shift, a dramatic shift. Um, but it takes a different policy and a more dramatic outreach. That will make a difference. Like I said, there isn't that uh, fixed identity as Republican or Democrat. It's an emotional movement toward a party or a candidate based on what they're saying and whether they're actually speaking to you directly. Um, different candidate, different message, they'll shift. Dr. James Zogby, uh, thank you very much for being with us uh, here in the Gulf International Forum podcast. It was great having you and it's great to hear your insights. I mean, uh, just hours, I mean, for the elections. Thank you very much for being with us and uh, Looking forward for future also conversations. Call me again. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.